I'm an English and literature teacher and an avid reader, so I love metaphors as a way for making meaning. I often find myself comparing education to the worlds of various texts. One of the metaphors that resonates with me is that being in education can feel like existing in Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, an 1865 novel about a girl who falls down a rabbit hole into a fantasy land with strange creatures and absurd goings on. This metaphor is a playful way to examine education reform and to whom we should listen in education. The novel is set simultaneously in Victorian England and in the imaginary world of Wonderland. The characters in the novel are contained <coughs> and constrained within the world within which they exist. The regimentations of Victorian England reflect the constraints of our current education systems. There are rigid rules of the education game and inflexible, often externally imposed, standardised ways that teachers and school leaders and schools are measured. In Wonderland, there's a lack of equity, with some characters having huge amounts of power and others existing without agency. The autocratic Queen of Hearts might be seen as the international culture of testing, accountability and performativity. She's a force for panic and alarm, imposing a really narrow focus of right and wrong. Characters race around anxiously in fear of her. In our education systems, teachers might be thought of as the white rabbit, racing around, watching the time, constantly trying to meet deadlines and external pressures, ever-increasing workloads. Teachers are mostly absent in the formulation of policy on advisory boards and on media panels. Often, so-called experts are called in to uh, speak for and about teachers and schools. Teachers themselves are often undermined and deprofessionalised. School leaders might also be thought of as the white rabbit, buckling under external pressures, challenges to their own well-being. But they might be conceptualised as the Cheshire cat, doing often invisible work, coming in and out of the spotlight, giving just-in-time advice and constantly code-switching, appearing in multiple contexts almost simultaneously. In the novel, the eaglet says, speak English. I don't know the meaning of half of those long words, and what's more, I don't believe you do either. Education buzzwords can become nonsense language devoid of meaning. Academic writing can be impenetrable for practitioners. Con conflicting advice abounds, and those of us in schools and in research must make sense of multiple competing voices. <coughs> to whom should we listen? As a teacher, school leader, coach and researcher, I feel a lot like Alice tumbling down the rabbit hole, muddling my way through a foreign landscape, belonging and not belonging, betwixt and between. Constantly working to make sense of the education world, to sort through a sea of different ideas and to make my own voice and the voice of my profession heard. I've taught in schools in Australia and England for 20 years. I've been a school leader for almost as long. In middle leadership positions, I was the voice of school leaders down and the voice of teachers up. Now on a school executive, I eke out the voices of teachers, students and families so that when we seek to improve, we do so in ways relevant to our context and our community. When I speak and write, I'm a voice of my profession. My voice comes from within the education system, yet as a pracademic, as Pierre said, I'm bestride both the practitioner world of schools and the scholarly world of research, and my dual roles inform one another. The, the research that I read and um, interpret is influenced by my daily work in schools and my daily work in lessons, meetings, operational strategic work is influenced by the research that I read and undertake. Yet, my dual roles mean that I have quite a different perspective to those who advise from the sidelines. I know what it feels like to be a cog in the school reform wheel. In these ways, I operate as a bridge betwixt and between research and practice. Like Wonderland, which seems confusing to the newcomer Alice, schools and education systems are complex. They're non-linear, ecological, and full of interlocking relationships. In schools, we navigate competing demands with the needs of our students and with the moral purpose of the greater good. In schools, change happens in ways in which researchers and school boards don't or can't suppose. 
the work that we do in schools and education systems is not easily quantifiable. In fact, measuring and ranking schools can diminish the humanity of education. Often what we can measure is not what matters. Wonderland was perhaps Lewis Carroll's way of pushing back against the regimentations of Victorian England, of embracing chaos and surprise and wonder. Many teachers and school leaders too resist external demands or play the accountability game while working really hard to protect and serve our students in ways that embrace their humanity. Metaphors work because of their recognisability. But as I reflect on the metaphor that I'm sharing today, I realise that it's limited and potentially dangerous. Partly, there's so many versions of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland that meaning can get muddied and diluted. But more worrying are the biases inherent in metaphor. This metaphor has a Western origin. It's a novel by a white British male author set in upper middle class England. Even though it's been translated into almost 100 languages, it's a work of English language fiction. How, I wonder, does this exclude particular views of education? Does it marginalise some from accessing its meaning? Does sharing this metaphor promote a linear, white, masculine, Western view of education that's all about hierarchical structures and economic agendas? So when I think about the question, to whom should we listen, the answer is manifold. We should listen to researchers who interrogate what, what we know about education. We should listen to parents. We should talk with policymakers who oversee the big picture. We should listen to students who are the core of our work and our why. We should certainly listen to teachers. They're professionals whose expertise and judgment should be a key and central part of education discourse. In the book Flip the System Australia, my co-editors and I worked to include a range of voices. One of our Indigenous authors, Dr Kevin Lowe, challenged us that Aboriginal voices, if they're included at all, are often tacked onto the end of books as an afterthought. He challenged us to think not just about who we included, but where we situated those voices. We all do need to listen to each other, but this is not enough. As we consider our work in school effectiveness and improvement, we need to think about who is invited and who's amplified. We need to include those marginalised or sidelined by the dominant narrative. We need to embrace diversity over homogenisation, but we need to also consider the risks to individuals and groups who speak publicly, because it's often those who are the most vulnerable that are the least able to speak up and speak out. But we need to seek out and make space at the highest levels for voices that are going to move us towards democratic, inclusive and equitable education for all. Thank you.